I think when I first arrived here, it was pretty obvious that um, things were very separate and segregated. You had sort of behaviour support over there, you know, people had physical needs over here, learning was very traditionally uh, arranged through individual one-to-ones or multi-sensory lessons. Uh, and it struck me that actually the best way was to have things as a more inclusive whole school approach which was about breaking down those separate little sections of the community within the school and bringing things together and looking at individual children who were individuals as opposed to looking at their needs and the process they worked through to meet those needs a bit akin to this sort of medical model of disability. I would say, and I say this quite a lot when I speak to people, it probably took three or four years to shift a culture within the school setting, which was both structural but also attitudinal, uh, and to get people to believe that that was a proper way of working. And I've got to say, it was hard work doing that. But I would say after four years or so, we had a critical mass of people who believed that was right, and we had some good role models in the young people who had succeeded as a result, which allowed us then to really start doing the business end of making things pretty decent, really, I think. Yeah, the inclusive nature of the school is something that's very important to us and it is something that we have worked on over a number of years. Um, and I think we're now somewhere that's known locally and nationally um, as a centre of excellence. I think one thing that I'm very conscious of, and again I um, remind my senior leadership team um, of this as well on a regular basis, is that it's very important not to see our staff as different pockets of people with different skills or different qualifications but to see them as one entity. So whether we're talking to our teaching staff or our non-teaching staff or our administrative staff, we deal with everybody in the same way um, and we give them the same opportunity um, to attend training and to hear the messages and to be, feel part of that team. So that is certainly one thing that's, uh, that's very important to us. Yeah, we've kind of taken the, the model that you have within a primary school. We've got 1,250 students here, and we've divided that into five colleges. So each college has, if you like, a mini head, mini head teacher we call a director of study. And that person has overall charge of pastoral as well as curriculum academic responsibility within the college. And within each of those colleges, there are nine forms, and each of those forms are right across the year groups from year seven right through to 11. So it's, it's a broad spectrum, 250 students within each college and a broad range of ability and also curriculum subject areas within each of the colleges as well. So we're in charge of the pastoral as well as the academic welfare. So we look at how they're actually doing pastorally across the board. We have a senior learning coordinator ahead of year and we have learning coordinators have that one-to-one -one daily contact. But then within my role as director of study as well as having a responsibility for the welfare and guidance, I look at how they're doing academically within school. I look at they're making the required levels of progress we would expect for their ability, what they've came in from Key Stage 2, and where we expect they would be at each uh, end of year assessment level. So we, we, we sort of track that as they actually move through and put relevant interventions in place to support them. A key part to it really is, is not having teaching assistants doing things for people. It's not having uh, very time limited interventions. You hear some people say, well, well, we've seen this need, they need a six week intervention and they'll be all right. And it, you know, it's amazing if they know that in advance. But the purpose really is having a fluid arrangement that meets the need as and when. And I say all the time, every young person, no matter how disabled, can do something independently each day. And we need to encourage that and give them more chance of doing things independently. And you can't do that with very fixed models of support. Um, well, currently at the moment we've got 14 general teaching assistants. Um, but obviously, um, depending on the flexibility or the needs of the department at any time, um, we can obviously um, enhance that by, say, contacting um, specialist um, agencies um, if we need additional support for whatever reason. Um, and obviously the members of staff who have specialist roles in the school do also support, support students in class. So for example, the speech and language therapist may actually go into a classroom base anyway. Um, so the roles um, are very flexible um, and basically are adapted to meet the need at that particular time. Now look after the provision for autism in the mainstream setting. Um, I also have another role which is as a person-centred psychotherapist um, to support children, students from across the school with whatever issues or needs that they might have. We, we do have quite a lot of students at Priestmore with, on the autistic spectrum, um, all with varying degrees of uh, need within that spectrum. 
So my role is to ensure that the needs of those young people are, are met so that they feel comfortable and safe in the environment that they're learning in and that they don't feel anxious or nervous or unprepared for what the school day might bring. There may be students who don't need the one-to-one -one level of support but need to know that there is um, a place or a safe place in school that they can go to particularly at social times, so for example break time, lunch time. Um, George was diagnosed at a very early age um, as being on the autistic spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, severe communication um, problems and social skills were a massive problem mm -hmm. which is obviously uh, difficult for him in life mm -hmm. and definitely in the school environment. So the things I wanted most for my son was for him to be happy mm. and to be challenged appropriately and those things definitely happened. George was so keen to come to school every day. Um, school were very good at helping, helping us make the transition into college and, and George has taken the, the experiences from here. It's made him very confident that I can cope with college and he is coping with college. It's based in the heart of the school. Everybody can access it regardless of need, um, so it is seen as part of the culture of the school. It's not seen as, as something to be avoided or be afraid of. Um, we're trying to encourage um, a lack of stigma for, for young people with uh, special educational needs or disabilities. And I think at Priestnall we do that really, really well. Um, and I think. Uh, a reflection of that is um, some of the past pupils who come back and visit and you know tell us how they're getting on and how they've progressed. A driver for me early on was to move away from this process driven medicalised model into a more therapeutic approach and I think the, the first appointment I, I made was a psychotherapist and the reason for that was a huge deficit in uh, mental health provision. Uh, and how people had to go and sit in the hospital and wait for CAMS appointments and perhaps miss a whole day's education for that. My role is, is quite unique um, in a mainstream secondary school setting um, but it has pr proven to be extremely beneficial for young people as, uh, particularly with disabilities but also without disabilities. Um, for those students on the autistic spectrum for example and they tend to experience uh, high levels of anxiety which can be a, a huge barrier to their learning um, and key areas of my work have been on working with that um, in trying to lower anxiety levels and improve uh, self-esteem um, and that has been massively beneficial to young people who have felt in the past that they don't fit in, that they're different, they're somehow should be shunned by society. That, that, that's the kind of words that they've used when they've spoken to me. Um, and also the, the other big thing for me at the moment, and, and possibly always has been really, but we've really um, taken hold of in the last few years, is the fact that the Lancashire Judgment says very clearly it's as important to be able to speak and communicate as it is to read and write. Yet many secondary schools, and often many primary schools, will have amazing literacy interventions, but won't see a speech and language therapist from one year to the next, or perhaps once a term. So we appointed our own speech and language therapist to work with our literacy specialist on developing programmes and support systems and interventions that look at language and access to the curriculum and wider life as a whole. And some of that initial work now a year and a half on is really powerful. Uh, so my role is mainly to work with um, any students identified with speech language or communication needs. Um, I work in a variety of different ways, so I do some one-to-one -one work, I do some direct work with students, but I also do some um, indirect work with um, key members of staff or with teaching assistants or teachers of classes with some of the students that I work within. I think the main advantage is I can um, deliver assessment and therapy around the child rather than them having to work around me. So um, I can look at a child's timetable and I can see when's best to see them. I know what lessons they um, might be best coming out of, uh, what they're not going to miss a lot of work in. For students it gives them that ability to um, work with a range of people. Um, 
I think it gives them ability to have still key members of staff that they know are in and around the school. Um, they know where to go for the support if they need it. But they're very much um, encouraged to be um, with peers of their own age and to take on that responsibility. An absolute key part of that is the training of teachers and understanding of the staff within the institution. If I can train a, a maths teacher to deliver an inclusive maths lesson that uh, supports a young person with autism, I can work with a peer group to make sure they understand the young person with autism, I can work with that young person themselves so they understand their own needs, you don't need another adult in there doing things for somebody because the whole school approach and the systems support that individual as part of the culture of the institution. So inclusion is the heart of, of everything we do in the subject. Um, we look at within RE, uh, we've been looking in the context of the Holocaust, so naturally we're looking at prejudice and discrimination. Pretty much all the themes roll together. Um, all the issues are controversial, uh, and we challenge the issue um, of how people deal with each other and how people relate to each other right the way through the curriculum. Uh, from an ethos, there is a culture that every child is important and that every child matters, and it's about the individual. Um, and that really shows when we're dealing with all our students, uh, looking at their specific needs, looking at who they are, uh, how we can deal with them, and how we can best help them as a person, and as well as their learning needs. Uh, and I'm not naive enough to think that we can do it straight away. Sometimes we have to work in partnership with other providers for young people in year seven and eight, but the whole aim is that everybody who should come to this school finishes with us in year 11 being as well prepared as possible for life post 16 and I suppose the best evidence for that is our needs figures, the young people that go on to education, employment and training, the people that are not in that is zero for the last two years. I think it's very easy to um, fall back to a system or a culture which says you can't and you can't because external measures perhaps will be affected. Uh, and also I think we look at um, key documents like the Raise Online data that's produced by the DfE. All our groups uh, last year with a very, very complex year group of Year 11 students uh, were significantly plus in, in that data uh, production. So it shows that actually those cohorts outperformed significantly national counterparts because of our approach here at Freesonal. Within the college we have what are called learning coordinator assemblies. These are assemblies that are not led by teachers, they're led by the students. They're completely crafted and put together by the students, um, overseen by a learning coordinator, and they will deliver them on a range of, range of topics. Uh, certainly fairness, disability, and how we, how we support people within school has been themes that have been picked up uh, by students and dealt with very, very sensitively. With some autistic children, what we've actually done is we've gone in and worked with the form. And in doing so, we've actually tried to educate the form how difference is not something that, that should be challenged or that, that, that people should be made to feel small over. We've gone and, and, and got them to look at a completely different approach to disability. Um, and in doing so, we found that the students have responded very positively to that and also been very supportive to the individual. So we've had quite a few successes of working with some of our autistic students here. I mean, one of the more interesting things we've done over the last few years is uh, using an animal behaviourist to do some dog training with our young people. So what was the dog training that you came to? Was it here at the school? Yeah. Tell us about the dog training. I think it's in the main hall, or outside. Mm. It's where people teach some dogs what to do, and if they do it, they say good boy or good girl, depending on what gender they are. And we decided to develop a package that was initially done as part of a targeted mental health project with the same animal behaviourist uh, and some psychotherapists as well as our own therapists here. And in effect, uh, the young people came in with their own dogs uh, and a parent or carer. And the, the sessions were looking at how those groups could work together with their own animals, but also with other animals. Uh, and it was phenomenal, some of the outcomes of that. Well, it takes about an hour or more in order to finish the dog training. Well, did you, you brought Toby into the dog training, did you? Yeah. How, how did Toby like the dog training? He liked it. Mm -hmm. Learning to stay, learning to lie down, mm -hmm. learning to sit down, mm -hmm. learning to crawl down. through. Mm. Crawl through what? What were they crawling through? Chairs. All right. Yeah. 
But the reality is that some of our young people who uh, were very complex and non-verbal, as a result of their engagement with the animals, um, were basically chatting away over the weeks in between and, and as things went on to anybody that, that would listen about the things they'd done and about the activities they've been able to do. So my role at school as a drama therapist is to do one-to-one -one and group creative arts therapy. Uh, so usually we will do a 15-week intervention um, that's working with the child's emotional internal world. Referrals are often made uh, for students that have gone through significant disruption in their life. This can be anything from war trauma to bereavement. It could be supporting a, a child with autism with their social and communication skills and their way to express themselves and deal with the chaotic world that they live in. And that might be done through a, uh, on a piece of paper through painting or it might be done through working role. And working with role, we allow um, I'm, I'm able to mirror the client and, he, and that client might be able to um, explore what that looks like from a different perspective. And so Mourinho, who's a, a psychodramatist, and um, he says drama therapy is a rehearsal for life. So the client can re rehearse new ways of being that feel more successful for them. Uh, Thomas has got cerebral palsy. He suffered a brain injury at birth. Um, that resulted in uh, him suffering with um, uh, um, poor coordination, um, poor balance and spatial awareness. Uh, he has speech delay, um, but he also has um, uh, uh, learning difficulties as well, um, issues with cognition. Um, his numeracy skills are very low and uh, his reading skills as well. Uh, and Thomas is one of those children um, who I believe um, thrives more in an environment with um, his peers when he's fully included in a class um, as opposed to in an all-inclusive school which um, has a, a, a smaller unit that can cater towards specialist needs. Tom's definitely benefited from having uh, access to a full range of uh, specialist services within this school. Yes, there is always going to be difficulties um, for a child with disabilities going into mainstream school, but uh, the right school will be able to cater for those needs and the benefits far outweigh uh, the downside. They, well, they have the right to be heard and they have the right, their child uh, has the right um, to be put in mainstream school if they so wish. If they feel that benefit, it benefits their child, they have that right to be in mainstream school. It's been good that I got like loads of help and now I got loads of friends. Uh, I always see like at break time and lunch time. Mm, I, I've been, um, to this Cheeto College um, look round two times and um, I, I like the course what they're doing because I'm doing media. Come for, a, come for a tour and I'll prove to you how it works. I would invite them into school and I'm I can basically prove how it can work and it's all down to attitudes and it's not about um, you know money everyone's got restrictions and um, with budgets it's actually how you use that money effectively and having people with an open mind a professional capacity to cope with the the changes in society and the way I always say to new Senkers is it's about standing up and doing assemblies to the whole school if you as a Senko stand up there and talk to everybody in the school, young people and staff, and say, this is what I stand for, this is my uh, job here in the school about equality and about everybody getting equal chance, it sends a clear message about that. And the other key element is about educating the peer group, um, especially those young people with hidden disabilities. There's a massive untapped inclusive resource in our schools, which are the other students. And you educate some of those young people as to the needs of their disabled peers, often they are the most inclusive people that we've got. And our most powerful images of that are when our young people with autism stand up and talk to their peer group about that and say, I've got autism, this is what it means for me, this is what you could do to help me. And actually our young people are really responsive to those statements and conversations and I think inclusive cultures facilitate that opportunity and allow people the chance to talk openly about their differences.